All right, so in the book this week, in the Habits of Grace book, we, uh, it was the final section, and he talked about three M's during the chapters. One was time management, one was money, and one was mission. And he basically talked about how the gospel changes everything about us. It changes how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we spend our whole lives. It changes everything about us because Jesus is worthy of of our worship. He's worthy of everything. But we're going to focus in on one of the topics today, which is evangelism or missions. And it's one that usually we can be a little bit nervous about, but we could all grow in as well. So just to wake us up, I want to hear from you guys again. When I say evangelism... What comes to mind? Do you get nervous? Do you think of street preachers? Do you think of tracks? Do you think of being excited to share the news? What is it? What do you think of? Yeah. Conversations. Conversations. Good. Good. Sharing with close friends and family. Good. Yeah. Good. How we live our lives. Good. How many of you guys have been through an evangelism training of some kind? Okay, so like a couple. That's good to know. Uh, Yeah, I I was doing some research for this, and there was a Barna study that said that most Christians have never had any kind of evangelism training. Uh, So hopefully this time will help us with that as well as give us some motivation and tools for how to do that. But um, I've shared my story in the past. Some of you guys know my husband and I lived for a couple years overseas, we, it was our job to share the gospel with people who had never heard it before, and we were in a big Muslim country, um, but there is so much irony to the fact that we, that I, was a missionary because I struggled a ton with fear of man growing up. I still struggle some, but not like before. When I was in high school, there was a year that I think I said maybe 10 words during my whole lunch, like the lunch period, because I was so insecure. I was insecure in my body. I was scared what people were going to think about me if I said something. I was just very, very, very shy. And uh, during that same time, I started to become convicted that if I truly believed the gospel, I was a Christian, that I should be sharing my faith. But I couldn't even talk to people. (laughs) And I was so nervous. And so I just started to just try. I would go to the mall and I would go to nursing homes, and I would just try to talk to people. I would spend probably more time in the car kind of praying for courage to go inside and talk about Jesus. I would read like Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous, and then I would go inside, again, spending more time in the car than in, in the mall. But I also got convicted during that time to share with my students, with my friends, but I didn't know how. And so I remember one day in particular being so convicted. I was in the library. I saw my friend. I knew he was going through a really hard time, and I wanted to share the hope of Jesus with him. But I didn't know how, so I wrote him a letter, and I like, tried to outline the hope of Jesus, and I literally, shaking, you know, walked over <laughs> and gave it to him. Uh, but I t- tell you all that to say, if you are scared in evangelism, if you feel like you're not sure what to say, I get it. I've been there. God has helped me a lot in this area. He's still helping me in this area out of love and out of conviction to share the gospel with not only friends and family members, but also everyone around us. So here's what we're going to do for the next couple minutes. We're going to talk about three main things. First, we're going to talk about what is the gospel. You see that on your handout. Why do we share it and how do we share it? So what is the gospel will be our first part, mainly because evangelism is sharing the gospel, right? So what are we sharing with other people? I want to make sure we're all on the same page with that, and then we'll get into the why and the how. Uh, But my hope for this time is twofold. One, I hope that we all walk away with a greater desire, a greater burden to share our faith with others. Sometimes we can just be so busy in our lives. We're just distracted. We're doing our jobs, and we're doing school, and we just forget. We forget that God has put us around specific people right now on purpose. And secondly, I hope that we grow in a greater capacity for how to share the gospel. Uh, For some of us, growth is going to look differently. So for me in high school, a step of growth in this was just learning how to talk to people. And then once I learned how to talk to people, it was how to have deeper conversations, kind of worldview conversations past how's the weather to... How are you doing truly? What's going on in your life? Joy, purpose, worth, those kind of conversations. 
For some of you guys, you already have those deep conversations, and the next step is to go one step deeper to talk about spiritual things, to talk about hope in the Lord, who Jesus is. And so I think we can all take a step forward, even if it is just getting to know your neighbor. That's a step forward in the, in the path towards getting to, to share the gospel. Okay, so let's start on our worksheet with uh, that first question, what is the gospel? So the gospel literally means good news, and when we talk about sharing the good news, we're talking about sharing the message of Jesus, his perfect life, death, and resurrection. So the four points, main points that we want to share when we're sharing the gospel are God, sin, Christ, response. I know that's fast. I'm going to go through these, but it's the first, the story of God. It's a story of a God who loves us, who made us, who is holy, completely holy, completely good, no error, no wrong in him. It's also the story of sin, how we are sinners who rebelled against this holy God. The wages for sin, Romans 3.23, is death. We're separated from God because of our sin, and there can't be any good news until we've talked about the bad news of sin. But Christ came, our third point, Jesus came to pay the penalty on our behalf through his perfect life, death, and resurrection, and he offers forgiveness of sins to all who place their trust in him. And finally, that response question. Um, Sometimes we miss this when we're sharing the gospel. We just are so excited to get it out that we forget to ask them what they think. Have you ever heard this before? What do you think about this? Have you ever placed your faith in Christ? What's keeping you from doing that? We make it sometimes just a presentation and not a conversation. And the goal is to make it more of a dialogue, more of a back and forth, not just a one-sided presentation. Uh, Important in this too is just to recognize that this is verbally shared. So if we are going to pass out water bottles on the street or, you know, meals at the the homeless shelter, those are beautiful things. We should be doing that. That's worthy and wonderful work. We're called to take care of the poor and the vulnerable. But evangelism is when we share the gospel, which includes God, sin, Christ, response. It is the verbal sharing of the good news, not just, although we should be doing that too, not just the physical acts of service. Okay, so what is the gospel? Why do we share it? What do you think? Why do you share the gospel with others? Why would you, why do you share the gospel with others? Good. Mm-hmm. To share hope. Yeah, Lulu. Yeah. Absolutely. Out of obedience. Absolutely. Obedience and love for others, their care for their souls. Good. Those are the points that we're going to talk about. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This passage here is when Jesus was ascending into heaven. He had already died. He had already resurrected. And now he was giving his disciples a final charge. And for some of you, this is a very familiar passage. You have heard the Great Commission. You've been raised on it. It's in your DNA. Uh, For some of you, you've never heard this before. Uh, There's a recent, again, a Barna study said that half of reported Christians have heard or know of what the Great Commission is. So that means likely that many of us in this room may not, and that's okay. You're in good company. But Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this. All authority in heaven and on earth and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so Jesus is ascending into heaven. He says what to his followers? To What are his commands? What's that? Go and make disciples. Yeah. 
He calls them to go, and that's our, he calls us to go outside of our comfort zones, outside of our homes, sometimes even outside of our countries, to go and to share the gospel with those who haven't heard it. And not only to share the gospel, but to make disciples, which includes evangelism and discipleship. If they've never heard of Jesus, that means sharing for the first time, perhaps. And if they have, it means continuing to disciple in the things of God. We're called to share the gospel. So why do we do this? I have two reasons on your handout. The first being because we love God. We love God. We want others to know him. He is our greatest good. He's changed our lives forever. And we want him. We want his fame, his renown to just spread throughout the world. We, it's like when you have a really good restaurant, you've had this best meal. You're going to talk about it because you love it. It's just it's food, but you're going to talk about it. How much more so the Savior of our souls that we should talk about him. But within loving him, like Daniela was saying, is obeying him. So God specifically calls us to go not just here, but throughout the, the Bible, gives us charges to share our faith with others. And that's what we talked about week one with Jeannie and reading the Bible, how we're called not just to read it, but to do it. We talked about it last week too with James 1, how we're not just to be doers of the word, hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We don't want to be like a woman or a man who looks in the mirror and just like forgets what, what he looks like. We want to be someone who actually does it. Um, so we love God. We want him, his fame to, to grow in the world. We want him to be magnified and honored. Um, and we love him, so we obey him. Secondly, we, we share the gospel because we love others. The Bible says that there is only one way to heaven, and it's through faith in Jesus. And because we love others, we want them to know God. So Ecclesiastes 7.2 says this, For death is in the destiny of every man, the living should, should take this to heart. If we truly believe the Bible, we truly trust what it says, we believe that our friends, our family members, our neighbors that don't know Christ will be separated from God forever. From, they'll be, I was reading even in my study Bible this morning, not planned, but it had, it's the R.C. Sproul Reformation Study Bible, and it had a little excerpt on hell. And it was saying, sometimes we try to make ourselves feel better by saying, oh, they'll just be separated from God. They didn't want that anyways. But it was saying the Bible uses intense metaphors that are just pictures of how bad it is. The lake of fire, where worm won't, won't roll over, prison, all of the things. It is going to be eternal torture. And if we love our friends and our family members, that should make us weep. And it should spur us to action because we don't want anyone to perish. We want them, we love them, and we want them to have the hope of Christ. So um, I have an old pastor that used to say it like this. So imagine you're on a bridge in Miami. What's a bridge in Miami? Biscayne, okay. We're on that bridge. And you're driving along, and you see that in front of you, it looks like something's happening to the cars. You can't tell what. You slow down just in time to see that the bridge gave out, it's gone. You were able to stop just in time, you were so thankful, but the lane next to you is still going. They're speeding past that. They don't see the danger, they're just going straight into the, the pit to their deaths. You look around, you get out of your car, you're gonna try to do something, but you see a bus coming with all of your friends, your family members, your neighbors. What would you do? You would do anything. You would run out like a crazy person. You don't care how you look. You don't care if you look foolish. You don't care if they laugh at you. <laughs> you care about them so much that you're going to do anything to get their attention, right? So sometimes um, we can forget. If, if that's how we should be over a bridge crash, how much more are their eternal souls? I know it's not easy, and it costs us something. Uh, sometimes it costs us our reputation. Sometimes it costs us uh, time. Just the other day, I was on a walk in the neighborhood, and it was one of those quiet moments. I have, you know, three little kids. It's been a really crazy season, and I got to walk by myself. And I'm so excited. It was quiet, no music, nothing, just quiet. I'm walking along. I'm praying. I'm thanking the Lord for this beautiful day. And I see this old couple sitting on a bench in my neighborhood. And they, the wife, I find out le later, she has MS and isn't doing well. And I'm looking at them, and I'm overwhelmed with love for them and a burden that they would know Jesus. And I want them to know that God loves them, so I'm praying for them. I'm like, Lord, would you save them? I don't know their story, but like, you know, just save them, please. 
And uh, I become convicted. Maybe I'm the one <laughs> who's supposed to share the gospel with them, but this is my break time. This is quiet time. I don't get that often. And I'm wrestling with the Lord, and I'm like, okay, God, are you sure? <laughs> I don't get this time off. I'm going to be a better mom if I get some rest. And, you know, I'm doing all the bargaining with the Lord. This is not a story that makes me look good, but I'm bargaining with the Lord. And I say, Lord, okay, if they initiate a conversation with me, then I'll stop and talk with them. Don't do this, but this is what I was doing. <laughs> so I say, you know, okay, Lord. And sure enough, I'm walking by the guy, and he stops, and he looks me straight in the eye, and he says, what a beautiful night. Do you live here? And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk. <laughs> Even then, I'm still wrestling with the Lord. I'm like, okay, we're talking now. We're talking about where are you from and those kind of, but how do I transition deeper? And should I? And so I'm praying. I'm praying, like, Lord, provide the opportunity. Lord, do I need to do this right now? And I pray to the Lord, Lord, I'll talk about you if they bring it up. And sure enough, <laughs> the <laughs> wife looks at me and she says, what's on your t-shirt? And I was wearing a Christian t-shirt. And uh, so it was a natural opportunity for me to talk about my faith and ask them about theirs. Uh, he was an atheist, she's Jewish. Um, and I've seen them in the neighborhood since and we've started to build a relationship. Um, not an example of what to do, but it was a good story for me and a couple, for a couple of reasons. One, it was very humbling for me to recognize, I say that I love people. Am I willing to sacrifice for them? even if it's just a little quiet, you know, even if it's a little bit of my energy or my time, even if it's more. But secondly, it was a good reminder to me that the Lord hears our prayers. He cares. I was praying throughout the whole time for opportunities and boldness, and he provided both <laughs> very, very tangibly. And so we should be praying too. You know, Paul in the New Testament, he prayed for opportunities, boldness to share the gospel. And so if he needed that prayer, we do too. I have a little sub point on here. So we share the gospel because we love God and because we love others. But just as a sub point to that, it's an expression of an authentic faith. So my faith is such a big part of my life. If you really get to know me, you're going to know that I'm a Christian. It's just the biggest part of my life. Um, but sometimes we can hide that, right? We think it's kind of shameful. We're afraid to talk about the deep things of God. And so we push that aside. We'll talk about anything else but God. Um, but I've heard it said like this. I heard this story the other day. I thought it was helpful, but imagine that you are, again, you're at the beach, some beach, Miami Beach, and you're on a kayak. So you're on this kayak, you're going miles, you're just having the best time. You're miles from the shore, uh, haven't seen a boat in hours, and suddenly something happens with your kayak, flips over, and you start to swim. You're swimming, but you are miles away, and eventually you get tired, you know you're starting to inhale water. You know you have no more strength, and, and you're gasping for air. That's it. You know it's it. But just at the right time, a boat comes. And this boat comes by. This man sees you. He pulls you out of the water. His name is Tom. <laughs> My kids are watching Tom and Jerry. <laughs> so his, his name is Tom. And uh, Tom comes, and he saves you. He says, are you okay? He brings you to the hospital to see, you know, make sure you're okay. And he follows up the next day to check on you, how you're doing. He brings a card. He brings grapes. He's just taking care of you. He leaves just at the same time as a family member walks in, your sister. And, you know, she asks, who was that? And you say, nobody. Just someone I met once. And she pushes you, and she says, no, no, who, who was that? That's more than just like a stranger. And you say, he gave me grapes once. Technically true, right? Technically, you met him once. Technically, he gave you grapes. But how disingenuous is that? It's dishonoring to him. He saved your life. It's also disrespectful to your sister that you don't trust her with actually the details of what went on. Um, but we do that with Jesus all the time. We're like, oh, yeah, he saved me. But we treat him as if he's someone who gave us grapes once, like as if he's nothing at all. Uh, so if we truly love the Lord and we love others, we're going to want to share about him with others, right? So how? Actually, before we get to how, let's talk for a quick second about some reasons why we don't evangelize, because I think we all sometimes know that we should, but we get caught up in some of the, the reasons why not. So what do you think? What keeps you from evangelism? Rejection. rejection. Fear of rejection or history of rejection? Fear. Fear of rejection, yeah. Mm. You know, like, yeah. You know, like, my dad, I was sharing the gospel with my dad, and he said, well, how can a loving God send 
people to help. And I, I did the best I could to respond, but yeah. I think sometimes I get scared that like once they see me not having the answer, they're going to question my, uh, I don't know, real, like, oh, this girl's not legit, or she doesn't know yeah. what she's talking about, and then just kind of dismiss Yeah. That you won't know the answer, yeah. seem smart enough, um, be prepared. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Fear of man. Yeah. 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 Who are you to tell me? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I've had all of those. <laughs> um, let's talk through just a couple of them quickly before we go into how we can share the gospel. But I think a huge one for us is fear. It's fear of rejection. It's fear not we're not going to know what to say. It's even fear of man within that. Um, and that's something that, as I shared at the beginning, I 100% have struggled with. A couple of things that have helped me and that do help me. One is just to remember my life isn't my own anymore. It's the Lord's. I live for him. It doesn't matter if other people judge me or if they laugh at me. I'm approved and accepted in Christ, and I have what I need. But even within that, it helps me to remember that God uses uh, the things that are weak to shame the strong. So thinking through the Old Testament, he used Moses, who had a stuttering problem. He used Paul, who in the letters it said, oh, you're so strong when you're away from us, but weak in person. So he was somehow either not you know, a good communicator or not charismatic, whatever it was, but he was not the best, most ideal person that you would imagine for evangelism. But God used them, and God uses the things that are weak to shame the strong. He doesn't need us to have the perfect presentation to use us. He's the one that actually saves. Um, sometimes, too, we can feel like it's intrusive. Like, we don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. I know I can. And that's a good desire that we don't want. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. That's not why I'm sharing the gospel. But when we do that we are prioritizing their temporary discomfort for eternal pain. We're just swapping those out, and we're forgetting the eternal perspective. Maybe we're not sure about the exclusivity of the gospel. We're not really sure. Is there just one way? Is there multiple ways? Why would I share with you if, if you do you and I do me? And so if that's something that you have wrestled with, it would be great to talk with someone from the church. Like, what does it mean? When John, in John 14, 6, when Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes up to the Father except through him, what does that mean? That would be a great thing to talk through. Um, again, in a Barna study that I had read, it said that 50% of reported millennial Christians believe if you share your gospel with the intent of converting, I share my gospel with you, the gospel with you so that you believe, that that's wrong. And so that goes back to, again, exclusivity of the gospel. Is the gospel the only way? Uh, that goes back to fear of man. That goes back to a lot of things. But um, so if, you're, if you feel that, you're not alone, and that would be a great thing to talk to someone about. Sometimes we're just too busy or self-absorbed, right? We're in our jobs. We're in our workplaces. We're with our kids. We're just so stressed with the moment. We're so distracted and self-absorbed that we forget that God really has put us around people in a hurting world that need the hope of Christ, and we forget, we get distracted. Sometimes we know it's going to cost us. We know it might cost us relationally, they may make fun of us, it might be hard on our family dynamics, and we're concerned about that. We need to have wisdom intact for sure, but I love looking at the Puritans for this because they knew that being a Christian is costly. So Richard Baxter, who was in prison for his faith, he was persecuted for his faith, he said it like this. This is uh, convicting for me. He said, It is an inhumane cruelty to let souls go to hell for fear that we might have slightly harder lives. He says, I might do much to prevent their misery if I would just displease my flesh. He knew it would cost him, you know, maybe promotions or jobs or he'd have to go to prison. But he said, if your clothing be warm and your food be wholesome, you may as well be supported by it to do God's service. As if you had the fullest satisfaction of the flesh, the designer clothes, the gourmet meals, or, he says, a patched coat may be warm, bread and water are wholesome food. He that wants not these has but a poor excuse to make for hazarding men's souls so that he may live on dainties. And that's what we do a lot, right? We live on the dainties. We prioritize, like, I really want to protect my reputation, or I won't get the promotion, or whatever. And we 
do this inhumane cruelty of magnifying our own needs over the, the needs of those around us. Sometimes as well, um, to wrap up on this section, but sometimes we feel like people are very difficult to talk to. I have family members and friends that I just know are very hardened to the gospel, and it's hard for me. It is hard to not grow hardened personally and to grow, not grow bitter. Um, but he even says about this, it's the hardened sinner who cares not for your help that needs it the most. He that has not so much as to feel that he is dead inside, nor so much light as to see his danger, nor so much sense as to pity himself, that is the man that is most to be pitied. That's been a really helpful for, reminder for me even the past couple weeks, thinking about a particular relationship I have. That's just a hard one. And it's easy to grow hardened, but God calls us to be mercy, merciful because he is merciful. Those that are hardened need the, <laughs> the grace of God the most. Okay, finally, maybe you're just not sure what to say. You don't know how to share the gospel, so let's go into how. How do we share the gospel? The final section on this, this side. Um, I'm gonna give you some practical tips and then some practical tools, and then we're gonna break up and kind of do those together. So, um, first tip. Let's say you are convinced, yeah, I need to be sharing the gospel, I just don't really know how. Uh, first is just talk to people. Very simple. Start being friendly with people. Have conversations, step out in faith, talk about, hey, your coworkers, what do you do over the weekend? Maybe you use the Ford questions we talked about last week. Do you remember those? F is for family. O is for occupation. R is for recreation. D is for dreams. Good. So maybe you can use those, even what we talked about last week, being a good listener, being a good conversationalist. You can use those to transition into deeper conversations with people. Um, ask them how they're doing. Something that helps me whenever I meet someone new is to introduce something of faith in the first conversation. This isn't to save them or to make this magical conversion story necessarily. God could but more to help me in the future. So if I feel like I'm hiding my faith, it becomes way harder later to introduce the topic into the conversation. But if I, from the beginning, they say, hi, how, how was your weekend? And I say, it was great. You know, I took the kids to the pool, I went to church, I did this, I did that, but I've introduced the idea in the conversation. It helps me so much to just know this is part of our friendship. You know, this is just something that I talk about. It's my life, it's your life, we talk about this. Okay, next point. Get to know people who are unlike you. Sometimes we can be in our own little Christian bubbles and we just don't know anyone that's not a believer. And so if that's you, get to know people that are unlike you. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know, maybe join a sports soccer league with someone from church. Um, do have a hospitality night with your coworkers and friends from church. Just get to know them in time. They will have needs. Be a good friend, pray for them, take them a meal, get to know them. Next point is find bridges to the gospel. I'm sorry, bridges. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of themes that we talk about every day from love, joy, purpose, that we can use substantive you know, worldview conversations that we can use as this bridge into gospel conversation. So uh, Paul in Acts 17 is a good example of this. He's in this new city, and he sees that there they have a bunch of gods, and he has, they have this altar, and it says, to the unknown God. You know, Paul could have come in there and said, I got a message for you, repent and believe, this is it, this is the truth. But he used something that they understood. He used that altar to the unknown God to say, hey, I see you have this. You don't know who this God is. I do. And he shared about through a means that they understood, he shared the gospel. Some people liked it, some people didn't, <laughs> but he found bridges to the gospel. What could this look like in our lives? Um, the last plane li ride that I was on, I, uh, it was one of those nightmare plane rides where everything went wrong. So, you know, it was late and then it broke and then it came, but then that one broke and it was one of those, are we gonna get home? <laughs> I don't know. But finally, the plane comes. But while we're waiting, we're sitting in this lobby and um, naturally, I am one of the most introverted people you ever, will ever meet. I get my energy by myself, and 
It is conviction and love that I talk to people that I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sitting there. It's been long enough that I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to start a conversation. So I talk to this guy and this girl that are sitting next to me. And um, we're just talking, where are you going? Where are you coming from? That kind of thing. Can you believe this plane? Plane finally comes. We get on the plane. Under, you know, amazingly, the guy sits right here. <laughs> the girl sits right here. Not Southwest, not like you choose your own seats. We were all assigned to the same row. And I was like, okay, Lord, I see, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> but still, I like, this is not, um, I'm not the most naturally extroverted person. I would love to just listen to my audio book and go to sleep. So I'm praying and asking the Lord to help. Um, and so we're talking about things, life. I'm trying to go from past the surface level conversation to a worldview conversation to a spiritual conversation. So I'm asking forward questions. What do you do? Do you like your job? And the guy starts talking about his job, how he worked so hard, you know, mid-20s, he sacrificed so much to get where he is, and now he hates it. <laughs> and he's so unhappy, and he doesn't know why he spent so much time, energy, money to get where he's at, his boss, and he starts complaining. And so I see, okay, there's a pain point here, and I'm able to transition, not perfectly, but it transition into deeper things to say, yeah, I've had a job like that too before where I sold my soul for it. I sacrificed family, time. It was super, super unhealthy. And, you know, I think I learned that work is good. I think God made work good. But sometimes we can make it this ultimate good. We expect it to satisfy us, all of us. And whenever we do that, it crushes us. And we're so disappointed. And it's just not meant to do that. And then I've introduced God into the conversation and I'm able to transition into this tool that we're going to do later called the three circles, um, which we'll go through in a second. But again, I'm looking for a bridge. I'm looking for a conversation about joy or purpose or work to say, the Bible has something to say about that. How can I naturally, you're trying not to be awkward, but just naturally share as you would with anyone else about things that matter to you. Um, was I perfectly eloquent? No. <laughs> were they immediately saved? No. Was I nervous? Yes. But I was trying to be faithful, and that's our job. God saves. We are called to just be faithful and to try to pursue the conversations, but the Lord is the one who, who saves. As it turns out, the guy was a Buddhist-turned-Catholic, and the girl was Catholic, like, fresh to the States. And as we were talking, we didn't just talk about spiritual things. She started to open up about her life. She had just been cheated on by her husband, she was going through a divorce. She was just really having a hard time. We exchanged contact information, and you know, it's one of those things that you can, when you are earning trust, you're going from surface to worldview, you're showing that you care, and you're trying to bridge into spiritual conversations, caring for them, making it a conversation, not just a uh, one-sided presentation. Okay, we'll talk about the three circles in a second, but the next point on our practical tips, live in a way that honors God. So Ripley, this goes into what you were saying too about people are watching how we live, right? They, they see us, if we're not living, if we're living just like them, they're gonna see that too. And so we wanna live in a way not perfect. God doesn't perf you know, demand perfection from us, but he's covered us by the blood of Christ. But we are called to live in ways that honor him. So just the other day, I was at Publix and I was in the sub line and it was taking forever. And it was so long, in fact, that I was like, okay, I had the kids with me, they're, they're losing it. And I'm like, okay, kids, I think we're gonna go. We waited out, finally we're at the front. And the girl behind the counter looks at me and she says, are you a Christian? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and she says, no, no, your, your sweater. I had a Sheridan Hills Christian School on my sweater. And I'm like, Lord, thank you that I didn't lose my temper <laughs> because I almost did many times. But people, strangers are watching how we live. Evidently, if you wear a Christian shirt, they're always watching what you're, what you're doing. Um, family members are watching what you're doing. So not to provoke fear, but rather just to be faithful, that we're called to live in ways that honor Christ. Finally, spend time praying for the lost. Again, God provides the opportunities. He's the one that saves. And so we should be praying for them. We should be praying for opportunities, for boldness, uh, praying for, they, for them, for their souls, that God would open their eyes. And as we are praying, often we see more opportunities too. 
So, um, like I said, we were overseas for a couple years. And one year in Thailand, we had an evangelism training. And so we learned how to share the gospel. The guy said, okay, tonight you're going to all go out to dinner. I want you guys to go and share the gospel while you're out. And so we did. We prayed. We went out. I found some girls, shared with them. Ronald found, I think he was a drug dealer. It was very sketchy, but he found a guy. <laughs> and we made it. <laughs> we survived. But he shared the gospel with them. And the next day, this professor said, okay, how many of you guys, or maybe 30 of us, how many of you guys shared the gospel? Every hand went up. He said, how many of you would have shared the gospel if we hadn't prayed, been looking for opportunities, had that in our minds? Every hand went down. It was a very good reminder for me that we need to be praying for opportunities, but also for accountability, that this should be a normal part of our conversations to say, hey, how are you doing with your coworkers? Have you had any good conversations with them recently? How are you doing with your neighbors? You know, how are you doing in general with just evangelism? Because that's how we grow, but also as we're praying, we're looking for opportunities. Okay, so those are some tips, but let's say you've done all this, you have prayed, you feel convicted, you want to do this, and now you're in the conversation, someone's called out your t-shirt, <laughs> and you're saying, okay, now what do I say? I'm going to give you three practical tools, and we're going to practice two of them together. So this is going to be a little bit more workshoppy um, for the next couple minutes. The first tool is personal testimony. So if you flip on the back side, there are some different prompts that we're going to, I'm going to give you a minute to fill those out in a second. But um, personal testimonies, what is a personal testimony? It's just an opportunity to share about what God has done in your life. It can be your salvation story, how God has saved you, brought you from darkness to light. It could be, like I was saved as a little girl. It's hard for me to remember before and I don't have a very dramatic, I was little, little girl. And so sometimes I, instead of saying, I was a little girl in the church, if I'm talking to someone who has no context for that, I might say a story of grace since then. So I really struggle with perfectionism. Man, I have struggled with perfectionism my whole life. This is what this looked like. This is how Jesus changed me. This is how I am now. It could be your dating life. I have, man, I have looked for a man. I have found all, I've looked, placed all my hope in this guy. But actually, I have found that the love of Christ is so much deeper and richer than anything. I still want to get married, but I am actually content and joyful in the Lord. Or maybe it's your money, your spending, or you think, you know, before I was a Christian, I put all my worth in my stuff. I wanted this, that, and the other. Jesus changed my priorities. And you're talking to someone, and you're introducing the stories of how God has changed you. So, um, Per personal testimonies are such a beautiful way to share the stories of God because you're inviting someone in your life. It's not this distant God out there. It's intimate. I'm opening up my story to you. I'm sharing my life. And you're also inviting them into your worldview for a second. It's the beauty of storytelling. Whenever you tell a story, you, you kind of suspend your old beliefs for a second, and you're with them in, their new, in the story. So you're inviting them to view things from your lens for a second in your worldview. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a minute or two now on this worksheet to uh, think through before, during, and after. And then we're going to split up into groups, and we're going to practice. I'm going to have two people in each group, whoever you want, share. But I'm going to time you. <laughs> so sometimes when we're sharing the gospel, we can just get kind of, or when we're sharing our stories, we can kind of get overwhelmed. Like, we, we lose our train of thought. And so we've been talking for 10 minutes about someone we met in 10th grade that has no <laughs> relevance to the story. So I'm going to give you three minutes in your groups to share, the, to share your testimony, Okay. So I'm giving you the warning, but for now I'm going to give you a minute to fill this out on your worksheet, right? What was your life like before Christ? How did you come to know Christ? How was your life like since you were saved? Um, okay, so point being, again, testimonies, you can weave those in and out of conversations. They're intimate, they're inviting, they're testimonies of God's grace in your life, salvation story or something that God has done in your life. Um, and it can be a beautiful way to do that. If you have never fully written out your testimony, that is a great exercise and really helpful even to practice with someone else fully. Say, hey, how does this sound? You know, and you just get used to having your narrative so you're not like, oh no, what do I say next? 
It's just your story and uh, how God has saved you so you can feel more comfortable with that. Uh, let's talk through the second point on that page, which is Bible storying. This kind of goes along with that. We're not actually going to practice Bible storying together. You can stay in your groups uh, as long as you can see me. <laughs> um, but Bible storying is similar to personal testimonies in that it's using stories to introduce themes of the Bible, themes of the gospel into conversation. And I love using Bible storying in conversations because it's much more disarming than if you had someone to say like, okay guys, let's open up the Bible now and like talk about, you might have someone that would never do that with you. But you could introduce a story to the Bible, of the Bible in conversation. So for example, everything is really expensive in Miami, <laughs> right? Inflation, housing, that's like a normal conversation that we all have. Everything is so expensive. I read this story the other day about a man who was a farmer and he had a really good crop year. He just had so much stuff. He had so much stuff, in fact, that it wouldn't even fit inside his barn. So he built this, another barn. And he said, I'm going to save all the stuff that I have. I'm just going to put it in that, bar that barn. I'm going to hoard it up. And in the story, God comes to him in the night and says, you fool. You saved all this for what? And if I'm sharing this story with someone in conversation, we're talking about how expensive things are, and you say, yeah, actually, I, I read this story the other day. You tell the story. It really reminds me that life is so much more than stuff. Sometimes I can get so distracted into thinking I need all this stuff, and when everything is so expensive, it just reminds me my hope's not in that. You know, and then you can use that to transition, depending on your engaging interests. If they're like, okay, cool, <laughs> and they give you a face, you're like, all right, well, the word of God does not return void. You shared a Bible story with them, you know, through your conversation. If they're like, actually, that's really interesting, you can go deeper in conversation about why you believe that and how your life has been changed because of your new priorities in Christ. Um, again, Bible stories and testimonies are just a really beautiful way and a natural way where you don't feel like, you don't have to feel super awkward. This, to do this well, you need to know the Bible is you want to stick as closely to the Bible stories as possible. You don't want to make them up. You don't want to change the details. <laughs> you want to know the Bible story to present it in a persuasive way naturally through conversation. So something that I've done in the past is identify a couple of stories. The woman at the well is a great one for someone who's experiencing just feeling really shameful or like they are, have done a lot of bad things and no one would love them. It's a story that I've gone through and I've memorized the details so that if I'm talking to someone and I see like, I would love to just share this story with you of how we've all done bad things. Jesus knows and he loves you. And that's an easy way to transition through a story without just saying, God loves you, you know, but you're telling this story and you're weaving that into conversation. So maybe you could just identify a couple of stories that maybe are significant to you, memorize them, the details, and you could share them. But this last tool that we're gonna go over together is called three circles. So on your worksheet, you see this picture here. And we're gonna do something similar to what we just did with personal testimony, where I'm going to talk through this diagram. I'm gonna give you a moment to practice on your own in that blank space. And then in your groups, I won't time you this time, but in your groups, you're gonna do it together and you're gonna go through those discussion questions as well. Okay, so three circles, what is it? Uh, this is one of my favorite evangelism tools because it's relatable, it discusses suffering and problems and brokenness. And when you're talking to someone, if you're asking good questions, like we talked about last week, forward questions, you're getting deeper, you're gonna find something that hurts in everybody. And so if you have built trust and you see that they're willing to go deeper, this is a very natural way to transition into the gospel. I've done this in the playground on dirt. <laughs> I've done this at McDonald's. You can do it on a little napkin. Um, this is what I was using on the airplane in my mind. I didn't actually draw it out, but this is the, I was walking through this in my mind. And so this has the same themes, the four points that we have here, God, sin, Christ, response. It's God, sin, Christ, and then response is what you're, you're talking to them about. So let's talk through that, okay. Imagine we're back on the plane, talking to this guy. He's talking about his work problems. It doesn't satisfy. He doesn't get it. He thought that this was it, and it's not. He's just like, 
not satisfied, his boss is bad, his deadlines are horrible, his coworkers are messy. And so I'm relating with him, I'm talking about the purpose, the worldview idea of work, and then, in this case, he was open, and we were having a good conversation, and I said, you know, as a Christian, this is how I, I like to think about things, that God actually made the world good. So if you're drawing this, which you will in a second, you draw this first circle with a little heart inside to say God is the God of all love. God made the world good. There was no brokenness. There were no impossible deadlines or selfish bosses or difficult coworkers. Everything was perfect. It was good. What happened? And again, you're making a conversation. You say, do you know what happened? And if you didn't know, you say, well, the problem is that we wanted to, we didn't want to follow God. We wanted to do our own thing. So we rebelled against God. That's called sin. And when we did that, then you draw the second circle. When we did that, brokenness invaded the world. The Bible says the penalty for sin is death, and it just separates us. We are distancing ourselves from the source of love and goodness himself. And when that happens, everything breaks. Death was introduced into the world. Selfishness, uh, we're not satisfied. We have all, you can use it, again, you're relating to the person as much as you can with their story, but you're saying the world is broken. And we don't like that, do we? I don't like that, and so we try to escape it. So you draw these little squiggly lines. What are some ways that we can try to escape suffering? Alcohol, Alcohol, sex, Isolation. isolation, Netflix, suicide. You try to get away, you try to, you don't like this pain, you try to get away, but the problem is it's like a bungee cord. It keeps pulling you right back into this circle. You can't escape it. But God loves us so much that he didn't want to leave us there. So he sent his son Jesus, and then you draw this third circle. Jesus is fully God, fully man, and he came, do you remember how we talked about the penalty or the, the pain, we, we deserve to die for our sins? Well, Jesus took that for us. He took on our punishment and he died. So that little arrow, you know, you can personalize this, but in this diagram, that symbolizes death. He died for us on the cross. But not only that, he came alive again, and he offers that whoever turns and believes, whoever, it's called repentance, you turn from, from sin and you say, I want to follow God, you turn and believe, you will be restored. What does that mean? That means that you're clean, you're made right with God, your sins are forgiven, you're given joy, purpose, worth. And one day God promises that he's going to come again, and he's going to fix everything. He's going to restore it all. All of the broken things are going to come untrue. It will be perfect for all who turn and believe. Um, So this is a story of the three circles. You're doing God's perfect design. The problem of sin leads to brokenness. God didn't want to leave us there, so he sent his son Jesus. And whoever, turn, whoever turns and believes will have new life in Christ. And you're making this full circle. And then you could ask, which circle would you say you're in? Would you be in the brokenness part? Or are you in Christ? And again, when you're doing this, you're inviting them into your narrative, into your worldview. Sometimes people will say, I don't think about it that way. I think about it like this. And you say, that's interesting. Tell me more, you know? And you just make it a normal conversation. But sometimes, usually, people will engage with you in a story, and they'll say, I'm here. Say, what, how's that going for you? How, what's keeping you there? Do you want to be there? And that can lead to the conversation of, how do you want to respond to this? You have a choice, you know? And so again, you're weaving this into conversation, either in your mind, working through God, sin, Christ's response, or often, even in the dirt, you can draw three circles. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. If you have questions, I'm going to give you a couple minutes now to on your own, draw the circles in that blank space. Pretend like, you know, you talk to yourself. <laughs> Pretend like you're, you're talking to somebody. And then in our groups, we're going to do this together. But let's pretend, I'm going to give you a person to pretend like you're talking to, okay? You're going to be talking to Maria. Maria has been going through a difficult time. She has been dating this guy, and things just aren't going well. And she's really wondering, should she stay? Should she go? They're fighting all the time. She's just stressed. She's stressed with the boy. She's stressed with finances. She's stressed, just feeling very unhappy in life and not sure what to do. So you're talking to her. You're asking a lot of questions. You've gotten to know her story. You can make up the details <laughs> as, you're, as you're doing the three circles and, and invent her story for her. But, um, but you get to the point where you're saying, I really want to share the hope that's available in Christ with her. How could I do that? 
Okay? Yeah. God is our starting point, right? However, if you encounter a person that doesn't even believe in the existence of God, mm. if that's our starting point, it's like, I think where it's like, how do I, how do I get this person by proving the existence of God? So that's good. About that's good. That's, like, that's my number one fear. God is where we start. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. So often, that's a great point, because often, normally in conversations, I actually might start here because this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. So example with Maria, she shared all of these things, and I might empathize with her first, like the world is really broken, isn't it? It's not supposed to be this way. And so you might start here and talk about, we all try to escape. The thing is that God actually, I believe that there's, a God, and you're saying, I believe, mm -hmm. I believe there's a God who made everything good, but sin brought us here. Are we stuck there forever? Well, I believe that God sent his son Jesus. You put on, it's your, your story, your worldview. If they don't believe that, then hopefully you can have a conversation about that. Um, but yeah, that's a great point because normally in conversation, I will start here um, just to empathize. Good, good question. All right, so uh, what we're gonna do is in the groups that you're in, you see there's three discussion questions here. One is share three circles together. One, two, I mean, as many as you that want to actually in your groups practice it. Um, but pretend you're talking to Maria, that you're not talking to each other, but you're actually talking to a friend who's going through a hard time and you're trying to share hope with her. Um, I am actually gonna pray to close us. So that way, when you're done in your groups, you're gonna share the three circles together, talk through some fears and hindrances in your evangelism, what keeps you from evangelism, and then just spend time praying. Pray for friends, family members, share the names of a couple of people that you have on your heart um, that you would like to share the gospel with. Just pray for them. Pray for one another in that. Um, but let me go ahead and pray to close this.